Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis by mailing a check to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913-15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. In addition, you can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. I want to thank our latest Patreon supporter, David, for supporting the program at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, David. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. The original air date, March 25th, 1951, and the title is Breakdown. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joe McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joe McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Breakdown. It is shortly after midnight, the beginning of Good Friday in the year 1937. Jim Wiley, constable of Romer, Texas, is driving through the lonely outskirts of his territory when his headlights pick out a car parked on the road's shoulder. He breaks to a stop. Damn, some trouble. This heat conked out on me. I've been trying to get it started for half an hour. Well, maybe I can get it going for you. I know a little something about cars. Okay about trying? You bet. Go ahead. Looks like it ain't about to snort, friend. You must be out of gas. The gauge says you're half full. The gauge must be busted, then. Joking like I did, I should have flooded the carburetor. If gas was feeding through, we'd get the smell of it. I better check the tank. Get a stick or something to shove in here for measuring, will you? You bet. This branch ought to do. Yeah, it's good enough. Give it here. You empty? Dry as a WCTU meeting. Well, that'd leave me kind of stuck. Well, I got a siphon hose from the trunk. We can drain enough out of my tank to get you back to Roma. Is there an all-night station there? No, I'm afraid not. No hotel either. But I can put you up for the night if you don't mind bunking in the jail. What do you mean, jail? I'm the constable. Oh, I see. Well, don't worry. The jail's clean. Come on, let's go get that hose. How come you didn't know the gas gauge in your car was busting? Well, it must have just happened, I guess. Seems to me there's a car just like yours on my stolen car list. I hope you got proof of ownership on you. I got it all right. In my pocket, point the right square at your butt. Huh? Use your head, young fella. Stolen car is a bad charge, but it ain't nearly as bad as using a gun on a peace officer. Now, you better hand that gun over and come with me. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Why, you heck, you small town, Rube Cop. <laughs> you stinking Rube Cop. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, reach for you. Reach for it, reach for it so I can kick a face. Go ahead. Don't be a local. You can't get away with this. I've 
did that for from other dumb cops. You never should have told me you're a cop, you know. You never should. Something coming on your face. Come on, on your feet. Get in that brush. Hey, you look, if they stop, you're going to get it right through the room. Hey, you, where you off with this? Help! 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 <laughs> <laughs> Cross cut revolves. Go on, Pop. Yell. Yell all you want. Try not to yell that motor. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. That's too bad, Pop. <laughs> nah. You and me gonna make a trade. Bullet from this gun exchange for your car. What's the matter, Pop? Don't you like it? You'll get caught. They'll get you. Uh, the cop ain't born can take me. Come on, Pop. You're gonna die. Yeah. Why don't you crawl a little? Why don't you beg a little? Maybe I'll change my mind. I said... Bird! You could, you could kill me, but you... You ain't scaring me. I'll make it easy for you, Papa. But you gotta beg me a little. You don't, I'll give it to you through the kidney. And that ain't nice, Pop. It takes a couple of hours to die that way. And it hurts, Pop. I know I watched a cop die that way once before. You know what he's doing. That's it, Pop. Pray louder. Let me hear you. You're the one I'm praying for. You must be crazy. <laughs> praying for me. <laughs> you rude cop. Let's see who you pray for in the next couple of hours. <laughs> it hurts, don't it, Pop? And it's going to get worse. You don't pass out till right near the end. <laughs> Enjoy yourself, copper. Have a good time. <laughs> Constable Wiley's body was discovered shortly after sunrise when highway patrolmen spotted the stolen vehicle abandoned by the killer. The sheriff was summoned and he called for the help of the Texas Rangers. By noon of Good Friday, Ranger Captain Stinson was at the scene, accompanied by Ranger Jace Pearson. Wiley didn't die easy, Jace. Look at that. Yeah. Tried to crawl out to the road on a blood trail. Must have been in agony every inch of the way. Do you have any family? An invalid wife, two daughters, and three grandchildren. The man who did this might just as well have shot them, too. They'll feel the same pain Wiley did, only longer. With an alert out for Wiley's car, we might get a break. Killer may have been spotted in it somewhere along the line. I doubt it. He probably got where he wanted to go and ditched it before sunup. Medical examiner figured Wiley's been dead since about 3 a.m., must have been shot a couple of hours before that. Mm. Gives the killer a good start, all right, Captain. Yeah. Let's get back to the road. We've got one thing going for us, though. Man we're after may have left some prints on the car he abandoned when he took Wiley's. Lab men flew in before we got here. They ought to be coming through with a report soon. Well, Steve Clark is in town waiting for it. He'll bring it out. I want you and Steve to stay on this case until it's cracked. It's one I'd enjoy cracking. Only lead we've got is that the abandoned car was headed west. Well, that's something, at least. You and Steve can start off in that direction. Hey, here's Steve now. Oh, yeah. Howdy, Steve. Howdy, Jace, Captain. You get the lab report? Yeah, Captain. It'll rattle your teeth. Here. Killer's been identified by fingerprints lifted from the car he ditched. While he was killed by Rex Lang. Rex Lang? Rex Lang? Yeah, no doubt about it. The prints were as clear as a bell. There's a copy of Lang's record attached to the report. I don't have to see that. I know it by heart. I wonder how long he's been in Texas. Well, he might have been here for a year or more. Last report on him was when he killed a policeman in Great Falls, Montana. Before that, he pulled jobs in Nebraska, Wyoming, and Iowa. Mm, he's blazed quite a trail. Yes, and I want that trail to end in Texas. It's the first time he's paid us a visit. I want it to be the last. He's not easy to catch. According to that report, he's been jailed only once, Idaho State Reformatory, when he was 16. That's about eight years ago. Yeah, and in that eight years, he's killed six people, four of them peace officers. The first one was the guard at the reformatory. Lang butchered him when he escaped. Look at this record. Look at it. Sent to the reformatory for beating his young brother half to death with a stove poker. Is that Lang's picture clipped on the report? Yeah, a mug shot taken at the reformatory. Well, that'll help us. I don't know, Steve. A big-boned 16-year-old kid. And we're looking for a 24-year-old man. He could have filled out plenty by now. It'd be hard to recognize. Well, uh, there ought to be some description since then. Ought to be, but there aren't. All the witnesses he's left are dead ones. 
Is this the complete report? Yeah, that's it, Captain. Oh, except this. It probably doesn't mean anything. The sheriff picked up this empty matchbook. It was just lying in back of where Wiley's car was parked here on the shoulder. Lab checked it for prints, but they couldn't pull anything off of it. Well, it might have been thrown from any passing car. Yeah, I guess so. Let me see it. Advertising on the cover. Grand Bowling Alley in Pintado. Pintado's about 70 miles west, Jace. And that's the way the car was headed. He couldn't pick up matches before he got there. Not unless he'd been in Pintado before and was headed back there again when he tripped over Wiley. Well, that's possible. Our trail leads west anyhow. Won't do any harm to check around Pintado when we get there. You're towing a double horse trailer, Jace, so you and Steve might as well ride together. Suits me. I'll load my horse and put him in with charcoal. There's something about Rex Lang it might pay to remember. He was a ladies' man back where he came from, Pocatello, Idaho. All right, boy. Back up. Even when he was 14? Yeah, even then. It was a high school girl who smuggled in the knife he used to kill the reformatory guard. And there have been indications that he had a woman lookout with him on burglaries where his prints have been found. I'll get my trailer open for you, Steve. Thanks, Jase. Uh, company for you, Charky. No. Oh, you stay in, boy. Ah, uh, you climb in, boy. Come on, head on. Okay, Jase. I guess we're ready to roll. You'll hear from us, Captain. Uh, Jace, Steve. Yeah. What's the matter, Captain? You both know Lang's record. A killer with a crazy hate for all peace officers. So understand that what I'm going to say now is not in order. If you corner him, you'll have a mad dog on your hands. But I'd like to have him taken alive. That may not be easy, Captain. I know, but Rex Lang has become an idol to young punks and reform school toughs all over the country. Now, if we can put him on trial, convict him in a court of law, and have him executed by the state, it'll show those kids that society is strong enough to stamp him out like a flea. There's nothing glamorous about dying in an electric chair. But if you have to finish him in a fight, he'll still be an idol. He'll say Rex Lang was so tough we couldn't take him, we had to kill him. I understand, Captain. So do I. Now, remember, it's not in order. I want both of you back alive, too. That's all. Come on, Steve. Let's go. We headed west, looking for a dangerous kid grown into a dangerous man, with a face we might recognize too late. By midnight, we checked the highway as far as Pintado. In the morning, we started to comb the town, still drawing a blank. That guy at the bowling alley wasn't much help, Chase. Didn't seem to recognize that old picture of Rex Lang. Yeah, Lang may have changed a lot in eight years, but if he made the alleys a hangout, the owner should have... Uh, well, you know, Jace thought the face was a little familiar. Maybe yes, maybe no. Lang was blonde and smooth-skinned as a kid. Hair might have darkened plenty since then, face and frame filled out. And he shaves now, a beard line changes a face. Yeah, yeah, he might have just passed through here and picked up those matches, so maybe they were just thrown out of a passing car. I know. Well, we can't waste too much time on a lead that may be blind. Yeah, how about some breakfast? There's a Mexican place across the street, Lobo's. That's for me. I'm so hungry, I'll even eat enchiladas for breakfast. <laughs> Come on, let's cross. Easter Sunday tomorrow, Jase. Wish I could be home with the wife and kids. I even forgot to order flowers. Oh, why are the captain? He'll have some sent to the house for you. Yeah, didn't even think of that. Buenos dias, senores. Buenos dias. Howdy. Let's take the boot, Jase. I'm tired eating on the counters. What can I get for you, senores? It is menu. I have everything. Uh, fruit juice, a couple of scrambled eggs, easy with bacon, coffee and toast. Si, senor. Buenos dias, senorita. I will be with you in a moment. You bet. Here I am starving. I don't even know what I want. Say, why don't you wait on the lady while I'm thinking it over? Of course, senor. Take your time. I thought you were hungry enough to eat enchiladas for breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, the man double-crossed me. He gave me a choice. I just want a container of coffee to go, Lobo. Yes, senorita. You want it blind? No, creamy sugar. And I guess I'll just double your order, Jace. Ah, what's the move when we leave here? I haven't figured it yet. You want me to put it in a sack? You bet. How much? Ten cents, senorita. You know, Jace, maybe we should go yeah. back... Wait a minute, here Steve. Here you are. Huh? Fifty cents, Jace. That's the senorita. You bet. Sit tight, Steve. Oh, ma'am... Just a minute. Are you speaking to me, Ranger? Yes, ma'am. I happened to look out of the booth and saw you. Don't I know you from someplace? I don't think so. You sure look familiar. 
You live here in Pintado? You bet. I must have met you the last time I was through here, about two years ago. Now, your mistake, Range. I've only been here six weeks. Oh, well, where'd you come from before that? Fort Worth. That's your hometown? You bet. <laughs> That's one on me. You sure did look familiar. Excuse me, please. You bet. You heard the wrong, senorita, no? Maybe. Grab your hat, Steve. Why? What was that all about? Uh, something hit me when she was talking. Notice how she kept saying, you bet? Yeah, what about it? That reformatory report about Lang. The part about his habits. You bet was his favorite expression. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jace. Lang may have changed, but I doubt if he's turned into a girl. <laughs> no. But she picked up that expression someplace, Steve, from somebody who uses it regularly. And it could be Lang. Well, it's as good a lead as that matchbook, Jace. It's worth following. I think so, too. Come on. Let's see where she's taken that coffee. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Breakdown, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We followed the girl, hoping she was taking the coffee to Rex Lang. The hope exploded less than two blocks from Lobo's Cafe when she turned into the doorway of a jewelry store, not far from where my car was parked. Doesn't look like the sort of place we'd find Lang in, Jace. And she went into the back of the store. Look through that corner of the window. Yeah. Now, there's the container of coffee on that bench right beside the watch repairman. Mm. And she must have brought it in for him. Guess he's the boss. Looks that way. And he can't be Lang. He must be 60 or more. Jace, get back a little. What is it? She came out of the back. She's behind the counter now. And she's working there then. Let's not take any chances on being spotted. Drift back this way a little. Yeah, that's good enough. She'd have to come out to see us now. Got to keep a tag on her. If she's Lang's girl, she'll lead us to him. Well, even if she is his girl, no telling how often he sees her. He's hot and must be hiding out someplace. We could burn up a week or two and then find out we're sending our dogs at the wrong tree. We won't waste any time. Not if we can get some information about her. I'm going to get to a phone. You stay right here on this block, though. Walk the corner with me. Yeah. Jason, if she was Lang's girl, why should she be working? If she was working in the laundry, that's a question I couldn't answer. But I can think of a good reason why she might be working in a jewelry store. Cased it for Lang to knock it over? It's been done before. I'm going to have headquarters check back on some jobs Lang's pulled before. See what you can find out along the street here. She's a mighty pretty girl, so it's a safe bet she's been noticed by other storekeepers along here. Maybe one of them knows her name and where she lives. Chase, we don't want to tip our hand by asking too many questions. Don't make them sound like official questions. Make them sound like you're just another man who's seen a pretty girl. Okay, okay. But you ever mention this to my wife and you and me are going to tang her. <laughs> Get going. I'll make my call and meet you at the car later. I called my headquarters and gave Captain Stinson a description of the girl we were tagging and a list of information I wanted. It was less than two hours later when he called me back. It looks like you may have hit something with that girl, Jace. I made a few phone calls and got answers that fit. What are they? Fingerprint records from out of state show that Lang's burglaries in the past included a jewelry store, a check cashing agency, and a private home where the owner was in the habit of keeping plenty of cash in the safe. Girl fit into those cases? Yes. A girl answering the description you gave worked at all three places. Only thing that varies in description is the color of her hair. In each case, she quit her job a few months before the actual burglary. That's the modus operandi I've been looking for. Well, if it was the same girl in each case, she always changed her name. Well, that's as easy as dyeing her hair. It all fits. If you're right, Jace, you're getting mighty close to Lang. That's where we want to be. Thanks, Captain. You'll hear from me. Jace, maybe I'd better send you a couple of more men. That'd only give Lang a couple of more targets. Bye, Captain. <laughs> The girl was shaping up like the extra joker in a poker game. By the time I got back to Steve Clark, he had a rundown on her. The name she was using in Pintado was Jojo Deering. That night, the stores were open late for the last-minute Easter shoppers, but finally the lights went out. We followed the girl to her home and staked out to wait. Five minutes later, she came out again. Hey, Jace, look. 
She's changed her clothes. Yeah. Wearing jeans and a jacket now. Yeah, but why? I don't know. She's moving for her car. I'll let her stay about a block ahead. Don't want to tag her too close with this horse trailer behind us. Right. Yeah, she's pulling out now. So are we. Steve, I got a feeling we're moving in for the finish. Why? The way she's dressed. Not the way she'd dress for a date in town, but it is the way she'd dress to go to Lang if he was holed up in some off-trail spot. Works during the week, goes off to meet him on Saturday nights. Yeah, Jace, it adds. We'll know soon enough. She's turning for the highway out of town. Looks like a long trip, Jace. Hey, hey, where is she? Took a turn off up ahead. You reach in the bag and get a Tommy gun. The captain said he wanted Lang alive, remember? I know. If we have to stop that car later, she picks Lang up. I want to make sure we can put it out of commission. Okay. Hey, we're crying out loud, Jace. Sorry, Steve. Sharp turn off there. Grab a look at the map. Where does this road lead? I don't need the map. This is State 61. Nothing down here for more than 100 miles except for a few run-down Mexican settlements. I'm going to cut off my headlights. This road gets kind of rough, Jace. Can't help it. I can follow her taillight without her knowing we're behind her. Yeah, you're right. Odd anything comes through here, she'd scare in a minute. But she'll roll a lot easier if we weren't dragging that horse trailer. I got a feeling we may need it. No need for her changing her clothes like she did if she's going to stay in the car. Any place in here where she could pick up a horse? Yeah, about ten more miles. Ranch owned by an old Mexican woman. All she's got is a couple of horses. Can you think of any place near there where Lang might be hiding out? Yeah, yeah, about three or four miles back in the hills. Used to be a mine there. A couple of them, in fact. Uh, They're abandoned, Jase. Isn't there a road to the mines? No, nothing but a rough burrow trail. It's tough country to get into. If Lang's there, it's going to be tough country for him to get out of. Just before we reached the old Mexican ranch, we let the girl's car pull out of sight. We parked for ten minutes, then drove to the ranch. Her car was there, all right, almost hidden in a clump of brush behind the barn. And there was a fresh horse trail leading into the hills. We unloaded our horses and followed it. Only about another half mile to the mines, Jace. She's heading right for them, all right. Something about this that bothers me, Steve. What's that? She stuck to the burrow trail all the way. That's just what I don't like. The only approach in Lang wouldn't be at the end of a clear trail unless he had some way of guarding it. You mean he might have an ambush staked out along here? A man who hasn't been caught or even described in eight years doesn't leave his guard down. I don't know. He can't stay awake 24 hours a day. I reckon not. Hey, wait a minute. Hold up. Whoa, whoa, Charky. Whoa, boy, whoa. See something, Jase? Yeah. This brush at the side of the path's been trampled not long ago either. Just bobbing back into its natural position. Horse was waiting in there, and now we got two sets of tracks on the path. Well, that means he expected the girl. Waited here to meet her. Looks that way. Better get down and lead your horse. Right. Come on, boy. Ah, come on, Charky. Why did he come down to meet her? He didn't have to show her the way. They're still sticking to the path. I don't know. In one way, I wish the moon was a little fuller. And in another way, I'm glad it isn't. Hey, hold it. Huh? Well, yeah. they left the trail here. Brush is disturbed again. The tracks turn in there. Come on. Yeah, this is funny, Jace. We're following their movements through the brush, and we're just making a little half circle right back to the burrow trail. Mm. Now, look here. We're right back on the path. You suppose he made that little half circle just to leave a blank spot in the tracks? A blank spot of less than 20 yards? Isn't likely. Must have had some reason. Let's leave the horses for a second. Let's go back along the path and find out why he cut away from it. Right. Move slow and keep your eyes peeled. Nothing that seems out of line. Here. Stop. Look at this branch overhanging the path. Just a branch? Why, it... Hey, Jace can barely see it. A piece of string running from the end of the branch to that tree on the opposite side of the path. Don't touch it. Let's see where it leads. Look at that. Yeah. Sawed off shotgun strapped to the tree. That string is tight around the trigger. Gun probably has enough scatter shot and slugs in it to kill an elephant. No wonder he met her to steer her around this. Chase, look at the way that gun is sighted. 
Anybody on a horse who moved that branch get a charge right through the middle. Anybody on foot who moved it probably get it right through the head. Hey, you were right, J.C. wasn't planning on taking any chances. A rat. Anybody could be killed by this thing. A rancher, some kid riding through. You don't think that'd make any difference to Lang, do you? What a death trap. A death trap that's gonna backfire on him. This is the thing we use to take him, Steve. When this goes off, he'll come running to see what he's got. He'll have another gun, he'll still fight. You won't get a chance if we work it right. I'm gonna pull the trigger on this thing, and then let out a scream. Plant myself out there on the burrow path. You stay here in the brush. Then what? Just be patient. Don't move, no matter how long it takes for him to get here. He'll come plenty slow, trying to make sure that whatever he hits alone. And when he finds me lying out there, fire your gun and startle him. But keep your fire high. J.C. might pump a slug into you while you're flat on your back. Not if we time it right. But don't fire until he's close enough for me to jump him. You better get the horses and time off down the trail a ways. You'll have time. Say, Jace, how about a toss to see who stakes out on the path? Why should you take the chance? Why not me? Because you forgot to wire the captain about that Easter plan for your wife and kids. Get going after the horses and then get back here. Good luck, Jace. Good luck to both of us, Steve. myself in the path and waited. I could feel myself breaking into a sweat as cold as the ground. Even if he thought I was dead, a crazy, hate-ridden killer like Lang might waste one more bullet. A half hour passed. An hour. And then we heard him coming. Slowly, like a cat. Watch where he stepped, Judy. I can't help it, Rex. I'm scared. He's blind like a cop with a gun in his back. Now shut up. Right near here, wasn't it? Can't you see anything yet? You bet. You bet I see something. Look at that. Look at the moon on him. It's a ranger. Rex. A ranger. A shoot! Be careful. Must be the one you told me about, but you were so smart. You said it didn't mean anything. You stupid getting followed here. No, please. Rex, don't hit me again, please. You bet, honey. <laughs> If you ever slip again, I'll make you an honorary cop. Now, come on. I'll show you what you get. I'll demonstrate on him. I wish he was alive to feel what I'm going to show you. Oh, no, Rex. Don't make me look, please. <laughs> now, look at it. Look. Imagine what a bullet could do to that pretty face of yours. <laughs> I got him, Steve. Let go of that gun, Rex. Drop it, I said. I'm killing you with my hand. All right. Here's your chance to try. Get the gun, go. Get it. Hey, you want to get up? Try again, Rex? Or is that enough? No. No. I come. I come with you. Shall I cuff you together, Jason? Yeah. It'd be a shame to split such a lovely couple. I guess this isn't the kind of brace that you were after, Jojo, but it'll have to do. All right, Rex, hold out your wrist. Yeah, that does it, Jason. Yeah. Well, let's get started. It's just midnight. After we get him in, a fast drive ought to get you home by morning and Give you a chance to pick up that Easter plant. Not only that, I'll be on time to go to church with the kids. You going? Borrow a couple of words from Rex. You bet. Tried as an accessory in the many crimes committed by Rex Lang, Jojo Deering was convicted and sentenced to a 50-year term in the women's prison at Gory. Lang tried for the murder of Constable Wiley, slobbered and pleaded for mercy, but the jury gave no heed to his pleas as the prosecution brought his vicious record to light. Found guilty of murder in the first degree, Lang was sent to Huntsville Penitentiary, where on the morning of November 4th, 1938, he died in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of The Texas Rangers. Joel McRae. 
Cray is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Byron Kane, Herb Ellis, and Betty Lou Gerson. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun, excitement, and prizes next on NBC as accordion-playing MC Phil Baker gathers contestants around the microphone to see if they know the answer to America's favorite question. What question is that? Why, the $64 question, of course. You're invited every Sunday for Laughs with Phil Baker and the $64 question. Tomorrow, enjoy the telephone hour. Now it's the $64 question on NBC. Welcome back. This was a story where I was curious about the real life incident behind it, and I assume they, you know, changed the name. So I looked up the date of execution, and nobody was actually executed on that day or any time in November of 1938 in the state of Texas. So I could not, I couldn't find the true details of this particular case. It does seem like. You know, you're talking about someone who committed six killings, four of them of uh, peace officers, and then was taken down by the Texas Rangers. It, it sounds like there should be a record of that somewhere. I was kind of curious as well about the whole clue that led Jace Pearson to our villain, and that was his girlfriend's use of the phrase, you bet. And that seems odd that that would be so recognizable. Do people not use that in Texas, or did they not in the 1950s? I mean, around here, if I if I followed people who said, you bet I'd be following around a good 2-3% of the population. Now, of course, you might be saying, well, you're in Idaho, and so is our villain. But I'm just not sure that's really an Idahoism. And even if a lot of people are using it in Idaho, it doesn't prove that it originated here. More than half the people living in the area that I am from actually moved here from somewhere else. If anyone is wondering, Pocatello is about a three-hour drive from Boise. And that's taking the freeway. It would have been longer in the 1950s. Even longer in the 1930s when this story was said. I've actually only been there once as an adult. I did kind of wonder a bit about the bit where Jace explained why he was going to be the one who would be the decoy, even though that was the riskier job. And he referenced uh, the other ranger not having called the captain to make sure his wife was taken care of on Easter. That kind of implied that Jace wasn't married, even though it had been stated earlier in the series. But I don't know if I would look at it as that, so much as Jace being heroic and willing to help the guy out to put the other ranger first. I do like to uh, contrast Tales of the Texas Rangers with Dragnet, both in terms of how the departments are portrayed and the series uh, and their overall feel. I think the idea of calling the captain to get uh, Easter flowers for his wife kind of gives you an insight into how the Texas Rangers are different. I couldn't imagine Ben Romero or Frank Smith uh, calling uh, one of their captains to uh, get some flowers uh, to their wife. But I think this goes to the point of the Texas Rangers being a bit of a closer-knit group. As the opening credits state, there are 50 rangers for the entire state of Texas. And there are were multiple companies. So less than 10 rangers reported to a captain. And they may have been under the same captain their entire career. So therefore, you get more of a close personal relationship than you get in something like Dragnet, where you're one of 3,000 guys. 
even accounting for the facts that Friday and Smith and Romero get shifted departments quite a bit, it, more than realistically. I also found a difference at the end. Uh, you know, the way that the uh, trial was described. I don't think on any episode of Dragnet, the after episode, uh, what happened, uh, described the accused as slobbering and begging for mercy. Now, I would say that Dragnet's ending was more just the facts, but I've got a whole t-shirt about that, and I've had multiple conversations, so it just does stick to what happened. All right, well, uh, listener comments and feedback now. Carrie writes, Hi, Adam. Congratulations on the new addition uh, to your family. And thank you for keeping the great detectives going during a time when you must be very busy. I heard Peggy Webber playing an old woman in episode 3758, Tales of the Texas Rangers' Blind Justice. It's nice to know that Joe Friday's mother spent some time in Texas. But seriously, I have really enjoyed Tales of the Texas Rangers and will be sorry when we reach the end, uh, whenever that is. Best regards, uh, Carrie. Well, thank you so much, Carrie, for the email. I appreciate the uh, congratulations. Tales of the Texas Rangers is going to be with us for a while. I think we've got more than 60 episodes left. And it's going to outlast all the series that we are currently doing right now, other than Johnny Dollar. And even then, it's going to be on past the time that John Lund uh, has uh, left Johnny Dollar. Of course, you know, there are a couple of departures that are imminent, which we've already uh, mentioned. Thanks again for the email. Now let's go ahead and we'll thank the Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Jesse, Patreon supporter since March 2016, currently supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for the support, Jesse. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. We will be back next Saturday with another episode of uh, Tales of the Texas Rangers. But uh, join us back here on Monday. We take one more visit to the Blue Note Cafe where... And Casey, you believe now that Grove was telling the truth. He said those memoirs were stolen from his room last night. Well, that seems to be the answer, Logan. Somebody who heard of Grove's threats to write an expose of all the inside stuff he knew didn't want something to become public. And that somebody didn't realize that the old guy wouldn't and couldn't make confidential stuff public anyhow. And, oh, nuts if oh, I had only... Look, Casey, quit blaming yourself. Well, I'd have reacted to Grove's story the same way you did. Yeah, so would I, Miss Williams. So would anyone who knew the old moocher as we did, pal. I suppose so. Uh, from what you've told me, Logan, this looks like the job of a professional rod man. Somebody hired him. Yeah. The killer worked fast and effectively and then got lost in the crowd. Casey, you know where the old guy's rooming house is? Yeah. It's a crummy joint up on 90th Street. Now let's go. I want to look at his room. So do I. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to Box 13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.